So I was wondering, yeah, yeah. did you have a chance to introduce uh, Dickinson cats to Russian poetry and Russian culture and Russian food? And what did you guys like the most? Yes, Adrian and I went last year while we were shooting, we went to something called Slava Snow Show, which is created by an incredible Russian performer um, and beyond skilled a clown. And then we went to the Russian Samovar and had a blast. It's actually been a really fun thing to connect with Adrian over because he knows quite a lot about it. Um, and yeah, and I've spoken with Haley about Joseph Brodsky's poetry because it was really my introduction to to what it means to experience a poem. So it it has been really fun to share that part of my life with everyone. I feel like 2020, everybody kind of related to Emily Dickinson more than ever because we were all kind of in a lockdown in our houses. So I was wondering, did it give you a new appreciation for her art and for her um, po poems? And how did you spend quarantine? First of all, this whole year has made me appreciate a lot of things in life and Emily being one of them because of the fact that she she sort of, well, ultimately chose to stay in her room over going out or spending any time in the kitchen or anywhere else in the house. That was her space that she chose to be in. But she also had no choice. She couldn't live the life she wanted to live. And the only other option that she was okay with was staying in that room. And she made the most of it. And I think that's what we were all forced to figure out how to do when, when this pandemic hit was how do we make the most of, of where we're at? How do we continue working? How do we continue living our lives? Um, it, it threw everybody for a real loop um, and, and has been a very challenging, uh, challenging time for us all. I thought about the Dickinson family a lot over this time and and specifically thought about Emily and tried to take courage from the huge worlds that Emily built from her bedroom and from isolation. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I do think to a sort of crazy extent, Emily is sort of the spirit animal of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's a model citizen for this year. Mm -hmm. um, this year, I got really into baking savory pies, but I also, um, I, I'm, I was inspired uh, by this season of Dickinson because Emily enters a baking contest and her pot, her her uh, cake that she creates is a work of art. So I am, I'm, I really want to try my hand at this uh, rum raisin cake that that she makes. Um, we need to get to track down that that recipe. I did, uh, a friend of mine did make the black cake from Emily's uh, Emily's cookbook, and that was delicious. It was so good. You have to wear corsets for, corsets for this role. <laughs> you have to wear like this hoop skirts. I remember Haley naming bum rolls even in the list of <laughs> Yes. So I was wondering, how does it feel to come back to it and to wear it all over again? It's a love-hate relationship with the corset because it is so necessary for the characters and so necessary for the clothes to look appropriate. Um, but it is painful for all those hours. There's just no way around it. Um, I am somebody who in life has always sort of felt a little pain is necessary in my clothes. Like when we went through quarantine and I was only in sweatpants, I like my weight went like crazy because I wasn't, I'm used to a little pain so I can know where I'm at with my weight. Um, so Dickinson, whenever we're filming is very good for me in that sense, because it's very, you're, you could really tell exactly where all your measurements are at the time. And it, it is so telling to the characters that the women were so confined and so bound by these corsets in life as as they were um, in a patriarchal society. I remember my first wardrobe fitting for Mrs. Dickinson um, for the season one, and I my my character is obsessed with cleaning and doing housework and being you know the most perfect housewife that she can be and i said well well this is a beautiful dress it's so luxurious in the corset but what do i wear when i'm doing my cleaning scenes and the, <laughs> the wardrobe designer was like this this is what women wore when they cleaned and did all their daily chores and i was like wow in that sense we've come a really long way uh, because now we can wear, you know, the most comfortable clothes to do any any sort of chores or housework that we want to do and choose to do. Um, but back in the day, they would get on their hands and knees and wash the floors and go chop the firewood and get, you know, skin the chickens and everything else they had to do to keep the household going in these corsets. So um, it's a it brings you into the character immediately, and I think that's what's super helpful about them. Putting them on is a is a real. Um... <laughs> 
experience and in, in and of itself. Um, putting all of those layers on in that corset and having two other women pull it as tight as it has to be for everything to fit on top of it. I mean, it's sort of this um, direct line into that time and, and it just brings on this physical constraint that they dealt with um, and it, it affects so much. So at the end of the day, it's it's um, a really helpful tool to have, but to have those moments of realizing that this is what we're doing, this is the character I'm playing is um, always, always really exciting. It'll never not be exciting. Yeah, I remember from last year, you mentioned you had bum rolls or something like that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, damn. Yeah, there were all sorts of things I'd never even heard of before, but yeah, I'm trying to think. I think I only have like two of those this season. Thank goodness. They make it just even harder to sit. It's already hard to sit, and then you put a bum roll on it, and it's even harder. It's just like, ugh. yeah, I don't know how they did it. I Thank love you. your spider dance so much. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm, I don't even know who choreographed it, but it was beautiful. Thank <laughs> you. That actually means the world to me. I'm so <laughs> nervous about it. Really? I it walked was in on her while she was practicing once, and that was that was like an incredible, <laughs> incredible moment. Uh, you are the best. Thank you so much. <laughs> Did your movie taste change, and do you think the audience movie taste will change, and they will crave a different type of content from now on? For me personally, I would say that it's been it's become extremely compelling to watch uh, movies from um, when I was growing up because I think that like it just makes me feel comforted to like sort of go back in time when things felt really different. Um, and there's definitely certain like I mean I grew up I was a teenager in the 90s and like there's definitely a lot of like 90s stuff in Dickinson too which is just because that's what I grew up on so um yeah I don't know I expect to keep watching a lot of 90s content over the next few years yeah I, I also have changed quite socially that I find it weird when I see people shake hands now and in, in in things or hug because in real life we're not doing that right now and so I'm like ah so, wah, wait stop they were all filmed years ago or, you know, before we sort of had this new social sensibility. So I think, yeah, I think it's, it's changed for all of us. Yeah. Um, and we'll see how it continues to change. What I liked about the second season is like winks at uh, contemporary culture, like spa days, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is like, wow, it looks crazy. Yoga in Victorian age, um, astrology and witchcraft. It's something that comes back. Did you want it to like kind of show that it was always like, you know, on a background and if you can elaborate. Yeah, both of those, both of those examples are so interesting because I find that, you know, in like for with with astrology and tarot, for example, um, what you're seeing right now is actually quite similar to what was there in the 19th century, which is that this becomes a kind of like underground space where women can actually really connect with each other and have important dialogue about um, feminism and social justice. And there's a lot of astrologers right now who are actually trying to do the work of movement building and, um, uh, you know, connecting people through communities of healing and care. So it's, but it's all happening, you know, online and in these weird kind of ways where you, you, you have to sort of tap into that frequency to know what's going on. And just as in the 1850s, the feminist movement um, and the abolitionist movement, they sort of rose up at the same time as this spiritualist movement of, you know, seances and contacting the dead. And it's all very interesting when you dig into the history and you're always finding these ways that, you know, the past is sort of just like the present. I mean, what's so fun about this show is bringing in these sort of modern elements and, um, you know, the idea of taking a period piece that we will sort of automatically think like, boring or, you know, stiff clothing and period monotone, whatever. This is like a very specific color tone to it all. And this is just as vibrant and exciting and, and intriguing as, as a contemporary piece. It, that's kind of, it feels like that's what it is. Um, they had dance parties, they cursed, they got mad. They, they, you know, do what we do. They were human beings. I think a reason that I love to watch period pieces is because I recognize so much of my life in them, but there's an amount of distance that I can just kind of enjoy it without thinking about my immediate life. And Dickinson kind of just cranks up the volume on that and forces you to look a little bit closer at the parallels between the 1850s and your own life. And I think it's the kind of eclectic 
creative sauce that Elena's created between the music and the language and the costumes that has created a, a, a moment where you don't know whether or not a line is a completely honest historical reference or a kind of irreverent comment <laughs> on 2020. And it's such a joy. It's so much fun.